Um, well, first, thank you for the invitation. It's very, very nice to be here. It's my first time in, in Ohio, actually. I'm very positively impressed by the, by the school. Um, actually, we hear a lot of stories about this school in Colombia, and especially because my students usually uh, want to come here. So I'm very happy to, to confirm that this is a very positive impression that I have. So I'll be very quick with this. Uh, I will start with, uh, with a project that it's, it's a very small project. It's one of the first competitions that we did. This was in London in the UK, but actually this video is, is in Iceland. But this project shows a lot about of the procedures that we do in, 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 our, in, in, in a studio, how we work. I did this video in 2009 when visiting Iceland. And I don't know if you have been there. This is this amazing geography. It's an uh, island, uh, three hours flying from, from Denmark. Uh, basically, just this road that is the route number one. But everything you see from this road talks about the geological past and present of the islands. So all these natural phenomena are always present and are very evident. And this island, uh, of course, behaves almost like an observatory for, for a lot of atmospherical events that are, of course, very interesting and are very visible here. So the very, the very first, first impression when I, I was there was that almost like a natural disaster could happen in any moment. And just after that, actually, it happened. This is the eruption of the Iaf Jaka volcano in 2010. Then maybe you remember this. This basically stopped all the navigation, the aerial navigation of, the, of Europe during a few days. Uh, and, it, and it was the worst since the the, the, since the World War II. In that moment, we were doing the, starting the competition in London. This is the Ash Cloud actually traveling all the way from the island to Europe. And, and in that moment, we were starting this competition in London that was very interesting. This is the Heathrow Airport, two runways, one of the busiest airports in the world. And there are plans for making a third runway here. So the competition was... Uh, it, it, was, it started because of Greenpeace wanted to stop the construction of the third runway, but maybe more importantly because all the people that live around the airport, of course, don't want this runway to happen because they have this condition already happening and it's going to be a lot more intense with the third runway. So we were a lot more interested in these people uh, living around the airport that actually the Greenpeace intentions that, of course, are a lot different. So in that moment, that phenomena in Iceland was happening, and we started to ask ourselves how to replicate that phenomena in the airport, and of course, caused by the people living in these houses. And this is basically because we were already seeing the numbers of what happens with this ash cloud. Like, for example, all the money that was getting lost because of this, almost like 10 million pounds a day, just on canceled flights and hotels for the people that could not fly. So in order to replicate that phenomenon and to involve these people, we started to look at the, basically just the blocks that surround the airport. This is a suburban airport. There are some farms, two to three story houses, very low. This is where the third runway is going to happen. And basically these maps are just the intersection between the air routes and the, and the houses. So this is the ideal location to interfere with air traffic in order to stop the airport for a few days to, of course, provoke the same uh, issues that the ash cloud was producing. So basically, it was about having these people putting objects or something in the air that will transform the airport into something uh, not useful anymore for a few days. That, of course, is very expensive, almost impossible. All these houses will have to transform into towers. So. In that moment, we decided to replicate the objects. So this is one of those houses with a textile material. So each pe people, each person, or each uh, house owner will basically pay for a copy of their house located to interfere with the air navigation over their house. So we started to do, this is just to show you how we work. We started to do these very exaggerated collages, but that was, of course, the ideal situation that we started to imagine. That, that is this, of course maybe very expensive, it's just the, a house on the same scale copied uh, above the original house. But maybe this one's a lot more interesting. There, there are many farms there. So probably the farmers will be able to, and maybe more real too, to copy their cows or other objects 
to interfere with the aerial navigation during a few days. So, of course, because of aerial regulations, one object is enough because they need to stop the airport. But what we were a lot more interested in the effect of this installation in a massive scale. Uh, and we were, of course, a lot more interested in this than in the Greenpeace background of the competition. We do a, a lot of models. This is just doing the model of the houses, the copies of the houses, and moving the model a little just to take the pictures, to take this into the boards of the, of the competition. This is another project in, that, that we did in 2008 when we were starting the practice. It's the Lake Park, Quito, Ecuador. This is a, this is a city that, that is the capital of the country in Ecuador. It's actually the city that defines the tropics. It's called the equator, of course. But it's actually quite cold. It's located almost 3,000 meters above the sea level, and it's a very deep valley. And it's a very dense Latin American city with a very strange airport because it's, of course, located in the middle of the city. So, of course, all these neighborhoods surrounding the airport are not the best in the city. This is cutting the city in two. And because of this, they did a new airport uh, just a couple of years ago that is starting to work and it's located outside of the city. So this airport is very, it's already obsolete and they did a competition in 2008 for transforming this airport into a park. Uh, the brief was very, was, was very open. The only requirement is that because this is a valley and this is the lowest part of the valley, they discovered that there is a lot of underground water in this point that will be ideal to transform this into an aquatic park of some form. So the only requirement that were, they were asking us was to, that this is called the lake park, is to do an artificial lake with any purpose or any kind of program. This is just to show you the, how strange, this is actually one of the scariest airports in the world because the airplanes need to navigate all this valley in a spiral to get into the, into the city. This is a famous accident that happened just before they closed the, the airport for big airplanes. It's an Iberia flight that ran over the, the, the runway. And this is the location. So you see all these mountains around the city. It's a very fertile, uh, there are very fertile ecosystems around the city that are now lost in the interior of the city. This is very typical of uh, the process of urbanization in Latin America. It's sometimes so dense and sometimes these areas are so, uh, are so fertile that they don't let uh, small pieces of this into the interior of the city. So our main concern was to recover some of these ecosystems and take them again into the interior of the park. Then is uh, a special interest in an already existing infrastructure. This is of course the runway. They were asking us to do a park. So a park is of course a lot of uh, very soft and maybe not so expensive interventions. So what we thought would be the most uh, expensive and probably the hardest uh, operation in this park was the removal of all this concrete. This is made for very big airplanes. It's almost one meter thick uh, surface of asphalt that is three kilometer long times 50 meters wide. So we started to think about how to use that concrete, that huge amount of concrete to define the geometry, but not the geometry, but also the use and, and everything about the park and to use this as an impermeable bottom for our, our lake. This will end up, of course, as a very strange lake, three kilometer long trying, times 50 meter wide. It's a scale that is very hard to imagine. I, I, if you ever uh, stand in an airplane runway, you, you cannot tell the distances. It's a very strange scale. So we started to think about divisions that will allow us to transform this runway into a series of aquatic events uh, that maybe will allow us to use the difference of the level, that this seems flat, but it's 15 meter level, to take the water from the north to the south into a series of aquatic events that exist in Quito, but outside of the city. So we, we are actually trained as architects, not landscape designers. Uh, and we usually uh, bridge that uh, we, we don't have the knowledge of the real landscape architects, so we, photography has become a very important tool for us. We travel a lot in Latin America. Basically, we were thinking in all these ecosystems, well, this is, not an, this is actually a treatment plant, 
but these ecosystems present around the area. There are some pictures of that, of those ecosystems, that's what we want to recreate into the interior. So this is a wetland that is very typical of the tropical areas that has the capability of having a very basic cleaning process of the water. So that the water from the park will allow us to make uh, an open air aquarium, of course, uh, with sweet water. The water from there will go to a botanical garden of uh, um, aquatic plants. From there, we were imagining in about taking that water to a conventional treatment plant that is present in every city so we wanted to put it in the middle of the park in order to transform that infrastructure into a public experience. From there, an aquatic park that it's pools and thermal beds, and from there, the recreational lake. So only a small part, this one, was what they're asking in the beginning of the brief. And in the sides of the parks, all the landscape events will be in relationship with what is happening in the interior. So it's this series of aquatic events. This is, of course, a more architectonic drawing of the same. But the landscape events, so all the species planted in the sites will be in relationship with what is happening inside. For example, all these trees will be the trees that are usually planted or exist in the borders of, uh, of, of water bodies like the wetlands. And of course, the this, this same thing with the other kinds of vegetation. Um, this image. Um, this is very import important for us because uh, maybe you can see here that the architecture part is just 2% of the image and the, rent, the rest is that landscape that is usually represented through photography. So we work with the photographies that we do and, and that sometimes is a lot more important in the representation process. Usually we have a, we as architects have a very, uh, we have a very big problem when trying to represent landscape events and is that we are used to AutoCAD drawings, 3D models, physical models, and I'll take this here better. So those, those kind of things, the landscape events. It's not working. No? Okay. So those events are, very hard to represent with the tools that we get in the, as, as architects in the, in the, with the architect's education. So we go to photography all the time to bridge that limitation. So this process of collage is not about representation. These images that are not at the final stage of the competition, they just, uh, sometimes appear at the beginning. This is something strange that happens in that airport and is that there is a golf field and it's only used by the military. So it's, double that. So it's the military in the center of the city using this very big space as a golf course. So that was a uh, location that we thought would be ideal for making an aviation museum. You see that all this very low grass that is very typical of the golf fields and it's this very flat land will serve as the ideal location for doing the aviation museum. So all the program started to arise in relationship to, to those uh, sometimes already existing landscapes. Uh, this is the next stage. This is the aquatic park. As I told you, this is, a, this is a tropics, but it's a very cold city. So we thought about having pools and public uh, thermal beds, but very small and in relationship to the, to the big lake that runs uh, based on the, on the runway. So this is an image of the same thing, but here it's, uh, this is a lot more, we were more interested in the atmosphere that is generated just by the difference of temperature. So those are the kinds of events that we are trying to represent in the, in the drawings. This is an open air scenario. So it's again, uh, an interest in working with a, a natural phenomena, in this case rain, it rains a lot. So this is a, an scenario where we were thinking that depending on the amount of rain, it will be the capability of the, of the scenario to, to hold a massive event. So this is the case where the scenario is, of course, uh, completely empty. This is a more architectonic view of the, of the aviation museum. So it's, which is basically just scattered airplanes. Uh, they have a very small program and requirements in the brief. So we thought about locating that into the interior of the airplanes. And with a very basic operation, these very shallow ponds, 
this vegetation will grow around these airplanes uh, in these very shallow ponds through canals guiding water from the main lake in order to have this landscape that is of course uh, the same images of those uh, wetlands around the city. So we are not really geometrically plan the vegetation around this park but trying to generate that in a some, somehow a spontaneous way just by having the uh, ideal conditions that is basically just water and just some very shallow ponds. Uh, in the tropics that sometimes is uh, enough for doing the, the planting of a, of a landscape project. This is Medellin, this is the city where, where I live, where we have the practice. This is the aquatic center. It was a competition that was done in 2008 for the South American Games when Medellin won the opportunity to host the games. Uh, this is Colombia. Uh, you see a lot of water here. We have a lot of water, but also a lot of mountains. Actually, this spot in Colombia is the rainiest area in the world, very close to Medellin. We have 275 days of rain every year, so it rains a lot. And also, you see, this is the Andes chain, and just in Colombia, the chain splits in three. So we don't have just a big chain of mountains, but we have a very hilly topography because the Andes have these three main chains in the country, and Medellin is located in the middle. And this is the city. This is, of course, uh, the real wild what is around the city and this is four million people in this very deep valley so the city doesn't have any more space to grow it's very dense of course as you can see in this image uh, this is in the north so there are not many flat areas remaining so this is very maybe this is very strange for you because of North America you have a lot of flat land but we don't so this is one of the last remaining flatlands of the city the where we do this this project and it's this area. It's a sport complex that was done in the 70s. Uh, nothing special actually in terms of architecture, actually very bad in terms of urbanism because it used to be closed by a fence. So in 2008, one of the uh, things about this competition was to transform this again into public space. On our site is here. And this is uh, an old complex of pools that has two big tribunes that was also done in the 70s and is it's not very good, of course, because a lot, everybody is interested in football in Colombia and it has two massive concrete tribunes, so it's empty all year. So we were in this strange location between a massive concrete tribune, one busy highway in this place, and, and the competition was asking us to design a, pool, a building for pools. So it's usually uh, walls, roof, that contains pool in a controlled atmosphere almost maybe you will have seen images of the water cube in China for the Olympics. It's a box with pools inside. But we were more interested in this. This is one of the first collages about what will happen if we use water as a way to divide the difference between what is public, what is private. This is of course clean water for swimming and this not so clean water is maybe some of the aquatic ecosystems that surround the city. So we will still need to have all the program that the competition was asking us. So maybe we could locate that underneath those gardens. And all this is aiming to transform the commission of a building into the commission of a park. That is something that is very different in North America because you of course have normally uh, very extreme weather. So you can't probably swim or have competitions in the winter, but we can do that in Medellin. So that was the trick in this case where they were asking us for a building, but uh, for example, one of my partners, he's a swimmer, Sebastian, he was telling us that Medellin is in this tropical belt where there are not many cities, but this is one of those cities where you can have open air swimming competitions all year around. So actually we don't need a roof for that. So this is one of those collages. So basically we wanted to not have any roof, not any walls, all the program will be located underneath the gardens. This, these ramps will take people uh, underneath the gardens to the bathrooms, dressing rooms. Uh, a pool building is very complex. It has massive filters, the equilibrium tanks. It's a very dense uh, programmatic uh, project. So all that will be located underneath the gardens and those gardens will surround the pools and serve as a division that will otherwise be made by walls. Um, this is more advanced images of the design stage. 
as I was telling you, we are not trained as landscape architects, so we are not real landscape architects, so we work very close with biologists and agronomists. They have become a very important part of our work because they bridge us these limitations that we have because of our profession. So they start as part of the team from the early beginning. So this is a biologist, Maria Antonia Posada, that started to select some plants that usually grow in the water or very close to the water in the tropics and especially in the area of Medellin. So these plants will probably not need a lot of maintenance in this location. This section just shows what I was telling you. Uh, this is a pool, this is the kids' pool, that's why it's so shallow. The program that they were requiring, the garden on top. Then there is, there is a courtyard. This is the equilibrium tank, the pool, the bathroom, dressing room, a courtyard again, and a pool. So it was a it's very simple system of pool, garden, courtyard, garden, pool, garden, courtyard. And the courtyard, it's a very uh, important tool because it's low, it's three meters underneath and serve as a way of separating the competitors from the public. So, as you can see here are the pools, and in these three meter deep holes is where the competitors meet with the trainers. And all this geometry just resulted because when we placed the pools, with requests, we can modify that into this very small lot, all these uh, strange triangles started to result. So this is the basement. It's very dense in terms of program. The filters mixed with the bathrooms, but what is important about this is this. is This is the first courtyard, second courtyard, and third courtyard. This is where the competitors meet with the trainers. Um, this is one of the first uh, pictures that we took during the construction. This was 2009. This is very fast. We only had like five months to design all the details, which is also very typical of how these things work in, in Colombia. So it's the small courtyard, two bathrooms, men, women, and the bathrooms also have small courtyards, again, with vegetation. So these decisions about the landscape with, were at the same time in the big decisions of the scheme, but also in the smallest details like the bathrooms and the dressing rooms. So this is three meters below. Uh, even some of the details, like for example, these cuttings in the concrete will allow the water to, it rains a lot, of course, to come down and probably transform the walls into extensions of those gardens just because this is four months after it was completed. Uh, the rainwater falls here, so this kind of moss start to form in the, in the walls. This is the gardens when the, the project was completed in 2010. Uh, I don't like this image too much, <laughs> but it, it, uh, the photographer, Ivan Van, when he went to, he was commissioned to shoot the project, he went there and he told us that this was not a real building. And, and of course, because it, it, you don't see any building once you're inside, it's completely flat. So he had to rent a helicopter just to take these images and actually sell the images to the, to the, to the magazine. But that's what we wanted, because usually these competitions are of, are of course important because of the games, but also are, provoked, are to provoke a new icon in the city. But we prefer this horizontal landscape in a city with no more horizontal surface because the games just last for a couple of days. So in the future, this will behave as a park and maybe possibly under a good administration, this street can be open so people will cross between the pools looking at what, what is happening there, so transforming that into a public event instead of walking in this two meter wide sidewalk that surrounds the site. We have only 1.4 square meters of public space in, in Medellin. These are more images uh, taken by the helicopter. So this is, uh, this is a little bit after when it was completed. This is the shallow pool they used it to train, but uh, this is what, what is important for us. With the gardens, it's enough for making the division between the activity that usually is inside a building and this street that can eventually be, be public, public space. And that was not in the brief of the, of the project, but it becomes the most important part of the, of the building because other activities that are not related to the use of the pools can start to emerge in those areas, like running, jogging, other sports, Usually uh, schools come here to do gymnastic of other, just other sports because it's nicer to be right next to the pool than right next to the cars. Um, the metro also runs parallel to the complex. So this is one of the 
only views that you can have of the whole uh, of the whole building. That is, well, the only building is the entrance. And this is the same, it's just the other side of the, of the metro. And this is what happens in those courtyards, that even though it's an open uh, building, uh, this very simple difference in the levels allows the competitors to have some degree of privacy once they are inside. So activities that are more related to the, that sport happen on, in, in, in these courtyards. And again, in the bathrooms, we saw these small openings. We always wanted to establish relationship between activities like washing the hands or taking a shower in relationship to the gardens. So these plants, bigger leaves, you see this is more like, the, like a jungle plant is because they need a little bit more shadow. So they, they are okay when they are located in these holes. Um, models, I always have to go to the models because it's the only way to explain this procedure. So we have ramps that take the competitors and then another ramp that takes them to the pool. And this is the only pool that is lifted from the ground level. This is because the competition wanted a pool just for synchronized swimming, which is a very beautiful sport, but it's very strange. Because <laughs> and that is true because it's a very hard to, to experience sport because they are basically swimming on the water and of course the trade didn't know what, what they are doing and probably their families and fellow competitors, but the public doesn't know what is happening. And the most important and beautiful part of this sport is happening on the water and is never exposed. So we decided to raise that pool. That's why we don't have tribunes. Uh, this is the only tribune of the project. We decided to make this uh, very, this is probably the only thing that looks like a building and is that we located what we thought was the most or the less important part of the program, like some deposits, tickets, shelves, bathrooms, to almost as columns to have this permeable entrance to the project and the roof of this will be the only tribune watching that. But this is what we wanted, it's just to take the people inside uh, but without having any, any walls or, or divisions with the street. So what happens with this pool the synchronized swimming, and it's, it's look, this is the street, so the public can walk through here. We wanted to establish a relationship between these people that is walking in the middle of the project and what is happening inside that pool is this one here. So the courtyard is inverted. Uh, in this case, they take the ramp, they train here with the, with the trainer, and then they take the ramp to swim to the pool. Uh, this is the ramp here. This is what I was telling you. It's a very strange port. All you see is this. So you don't understand much about what is happening there. But this is what we wanted. We, this is one of the collages that we do when the competition was almost finished. So the 3D model was ready, the AutoCAD drawings were ready also. So there was no time for designing this. But I show you this image because it was a very quick collage. It's just the concrete, the window, the activity that is happening there, and some people watching that activity. So they were interested in this almost as a landscape event. Uh, this is a picture that was taken when it was completed. So it was basically to transform this activity into a public event facing to a street that we were hoping to be very busy in the, in the future. Uh, these are some videos. This is a video that we do when they were, the workers were still working in the project when the team was already training. So this is the kind of uh, activity that we wanted it to happen. So people will basically cross through the project and see what is happening inside the, inside the pools. We just place these windows looking to, the, to that street. And of course, what happens on the water is uh, a lot more interesting than actually the, the sport that is being evaluated by the people that it's outside. Um, this is Bogota. This is the last project I'm going to show you. It's a, it's a competition in that was held in Bogota. This is the capital city of the country in 2009. This is when we were complete, completing the pools. And we won this competition in association with, with Manuel Villa. He's a friend, another architect from, from Bogota. He has his office there. And this competition was to renovate the main stadium of the, of the city and the country uh, in order to host the under 20 year old World Cup because Bogota won the opportunity to host that event in the last year. So this is from 1937 and is the main stadium of the country. And this is a big issue because everybody wants 
that this stadium uh, disappears. It's a very, it's really ugly, and everybody thinks this is ugly as hell. So basically, it was a very controversial competition because everybody wanted a new stadium instead of a renovation of the very old stadium. And probably they were right because this stadium was designed by a German engineer in 1937. It was not designed by an architect. It has the kind of look of this civil construction that doesn't have a, uh, is not really accepted in the city. This is one of the busiest highways of the, of the city because this, this is the one that takes to the airport from the downtown. And the stadium is very oddly located because this is the more expensive ticket because this has a bigger roof and it's just 30 meters from the highway. And this is a big square, but what happened with this competition is that they decided to invest in the stadium just in that part facing to the BC highway. This is because when the FIFA federation, the federation came to Bogota, they recommended the stadium to be renovated in uh, 7,000 square meters. So basically there was only money to renovate this part no money for renovating the rest of the stadium. And this needs to be renovated in order to the World Cup to happen here. As you can see, the stadium is, this is like an ugly view of the stadium. Uh, but it's interesting. We were, for us, it wasn't that ugly because this is almost, it's a very interesting collage of different engineers, different structures. For example, the very, the most internal structural axis is arranged in very, uh, normal columns, then another engineer did a renovation in the 60s with these new columns, then in the late 90s it had a renovation in order to be adjusted to the new seismic regulation. So it's been through four renovations and this is the fifth renovation. So we didn't want it to make almost like a mask of those past renovations, but instead doing a renovation that will allow this stadium to be the same stadium but at the same time offer a new image to the to the city. And also because, of course, there was no money for doing a new one. So this is the 7,000 square meters of the competition. Basically, we had to put dressing rooms, changing rooms, new areas for the press, new 7,000 square meters of new program compacted into this uh, area of the, of the competition. But of course, it would have been more smart to do it close to the square. Uh, so basically we propose a system that will be replicated in the future under an ideal administration, but we don't know if this is going to happen. This is the only part that is going to be, that is built. So basically instead of doing a new building with this 7,000 square meters, it was about using the original section in a smart way, for, for example, removing some of the stands in order to have views of the field from the new restaurant and this is more important, the, ent the entrance right now it's in the first level, so people have to take a lot of stairs. So we wanted the new entrance to be in the second level, so the program that they were requesting us became almost as an excuse, this is bathrooms, dressing rooms, press areas, for having this roof that will be public space and will be almost like a park going between all those columns in order to have this platform that will be used for skaters or other activities that are not strictly related to football. This is one picture during the construction. I don't have many images because this is just finished, but this was during the construction. It was just very basic operations to take light into the areas that were hidden. This is one of the images of the stands that we removed. So this is the, the new restaurant. But this is what is most important for us. We did this platform with ramps to the side to have this public space uh, that arised just because of the program that they were requesting us. So actually the truth is that that program was not important for us. That's just for the competitors. I'm going to concentrate on the facade. This is, uh, maybe you have seen the images of this. This is World War I. Uh, Normal Wilkinson, naval engineer got the very difficult commission of how to camouflage a warship in the sea. We, that, that's of course difficult because it's a big object in a completely horizontal surface. We were interested in this, not as a metaphor, but as a very unique technique of transforming a big object into something uh, to dematerialize it because it's, in a, it's visible from the distances. So 
of course, with the money for doing the facade in that area, it will be enough for doing the facade in the whole stadium. So we, want, we started to do these collages, try to see what happened with the images of the stadium overlapping uh, high contrast patterns. And those pattern works just because uh, the high contrast of the images uh, start to hide some parts of the structures of the concrete, the old parts or, or the new ones, just by hiding the difference between what is built and what it's paint. So it was basically just about painting the stadium. These are models just about, uh, this is trial and error, so this is not really very planned. It's just many patterns that we started to print and fold the paper just to see the effect of the pattern on the stands. Uh, we also did some tests more that we usually do, like these collages. But what, was, what happened is that none of them really worked. We won the competition with these images, but this pattern, that, that, that is the one that we like it more during the competition, was not effective because we were not being able to see the effect of this projected on a real surface. So with a projector like, like this one, a very small projector, we started to project images on the model, but this was after the competition was finished. And then we realized that more simple patterns like this one will have a stronger effect just because they will overlap with the structure. So actually these patterns are that we don't like uh, as a bi-dimensional image. This is uh, one of the uglies that, we, that we, we will discard it from the selection process. It will have this effect projected on the real stadium. This, is, this was very interesting because we rented the biggest projector that you can find. It was like the size of this table. So we, we did the same test with the real stadium. That's what we did here. And we realized that with this uh, average width of the lines, uh, we, we were starting to find an average width of all the lines, a structure, not a structure, of the all renovations that have been done in the stadium through time. And twisting this image a little bit will allow us to have uh, a distorted view of the stadium from the distance. This is also important because of the procedure for painting, because you need a car, uh, a truck, for holding this very uh, powerful projector. So we were imagining that the projector will be located in the car, at night, they will project, the markers will mark the paint, and the, the next day they will paint, and it will need uh, like 48 nights for doing this. So it's uh, located every 12 meters. And this is when we decided that the pattern was uh, just right to not being able to notice what it's paint and what is real about the, the stadium. This image is interesting because this is the first thing that we painted. So you see that there is no paint here. This is a, a picture. This is not a montage. We need to go back to the first collage because this is the only area that is flat. And this is the elevator tower that we transform into a bar by doing this addition to the, to the, to the sides. Thank you. We have a few minutes for some questions if anybody can have questions. Anybody? Jason? Uh, you talked quite a bit about the need to uh, not being a landscape architect to collaborate with uh, experts in that bit. Well, can you talk about collaboration just in the general, in these more kind of architectural projects? Is it really just between are you design collaborators, or how much is it also working with an engineer or other people in the design process? Well, we, it's, it's a real collaboration because they, they are not advisors. It's, this is basically friends. We're very close to, to, to biologists, especially uh, Maria Antonia Posada, who is a friend of us. And she works in the very early stage of the, of the project. So she just goes to the, to the team almost as a, one more architect. And sometimes we invite other, sometimes agronomists to, to work with us. This is basically because we don't know nothing. Well, we know a little bit about plants, but not as, uh, not as technical as they, as they know. So what is interesting of this collaboration is that usually landscape designers have a lot of knowledge about uh, plants and materials that are alive, but they are in the middle. They are between the designer and the biologist. And what is happening with us is that this profession doesn't exist in our country. 
So we, have, we as designers, we know how to design and they as biologists know really a lot about this material. So it's a very, uh, we need a lot more time <laughs> to, to develop a, a good collaboration with them, but it's, it's, it's probably then the most fun part of, of, of this process. How does a dialogue start? Because I mean, it's one thing to begin to ask someone questions and as they're kind of an authority. It's another thing you know, to really work with them at the conceptual. And it seems like you know, what you're doing with particularly with the um, pool project and other things like that, has, it, it seems like those ideas have to be present at inception of the, of the, idea, of the project. But where does that happen really early? Well, that, that is at the very beginning because so also because of the context. We, in, in Colombia, it's not that we don't have a powerful architectural tradition. We have, it, it's just that, for example, the modern tradition in Colombia, it's never as powerful as Venezuela and even Bra Brazil is on top, of course. So our architecture seems always very weak when you compare it to the non-built environment that we have and that we face every day in, in Colombia. So I guess it started almost like an accident, just because we studied architecture, started to get more fascination by the landscapes around our cities and in our countries, a lot more than, than architecture. And also because of the weather, we have this very, Medellin is 25 degrees Celsius all year. So it's a perfect environment for doing projects where the difference between landscape and architecture are a little bit more porous because we, of course, for example, can answer to uh, the commission of a building with a park just because we don't need roof and walls because we can have these activities happen all year round. So I think it's that. It's just a very in particular interest in the non-built environment of the tropics and also because we can actually do it because of the weather that, that we have. Anybody else? Tatiana? I have a question about your uh, airport project. I didn't understand how you dealt with the runway at the end. So did you uh, dug it out for uh, placing the ponds, or did you build up to put the ponds? That's a good question, because I forgot to talk about that. <laughs> so we basically, instead of digging the runway, we just go a little bit uh, we make a, a small field, so the runway will be in the bottom, and it will be the impermeable bottom of the lake. So in some parts, it will be a very shallow uh, one meter, 50 centimeter, depending on the activity uh, depth uh, uh, lake. So it was about recycling the, the runway. The other five. So the, uh, the, uh, the airport project, uh, we know that the Seem to be, it seems to be a sequence of water. So the water gets cleansed, then used again, used again, used again. What happens to it at the end of that sequence? Well, it's a recreational lake. So first we thought that was the less important part. Uh, so the activities that happen there are just the typical activities that happen in a recreational lake, like boats or just being in a lake. So but a also... Lake, is a lake in the park? The whole runway is a lake. It's an artificial lake. And at the very end is where all this water collects and just filtrates to the south where they told us in the brief that there are the underwater deposits. And the runway seems flat, but it's not really flat. There is a 15 meter difference. So it's and just enough to take the water very slowly from the north to the south, which is really the lowest part of the, of the site. Debbie? a slide to suddenly the water's moving, to suddenly people are moving. And it was just a really wonderful kind of flow within that. How much do you have specialists within your firm, or is that part of just how you structure your um, design investigations and presentations to clients as well? No, we, we don't collaborate with, 
with media artists. Um, so that's all in-house, your work? Yes. Well, maybe if you were talking about the similarity of, the, uh, of how these images feel and look is, is because we usually work, or we always almost prefer to work with our own pictures. So photography is a very important thing about uh, our work. These images sometimes, almost all these collages, they, they are not a representation at the end of the project that emerges after. Like we don't do a sketch and then an AutoCAD drawing and then a 3D model and then at the very end an image. These images sometimes are at the beginning and are done by, by us and usually using pictures that we, that, that we do. Uh, so that sometimes makes the images look similar between, between them. Well, we, we separate. So this is the first lecture. That's why there is not Paisajes Margentes is uh, my studio. Basically, I, I went for the landscape way and my two partners for the architecture. <laughs> that's, that's it. And this happened because that is true. We started because of these two projects. We started, uh, we, we, we not started normally. Like we didn't start to have commissions for a small house and then at the very end, these big projects. We got this, our first project was the pools. But after that, we started to receive some commissions for houses. So very organically, uh, Edgar and Sebastian started to go for that way and they are still based in Medellin. And they are great architects. But they really need to be working with, is, is what they like. So. There are a lot more architects than me, and I'm the one that are <laughs> a little bit more undecided, uh, I would say. Any more questions? Okay, thank you, Luis. Thank you.